An unconditional acceleration is a primer. By Xenigathic. In lieu of my grumpy unconditional accelerationism post from the other day about accelerationist misconceptions, I thought I'd throw together a reading list of easily accessible and recent online resources, with commentary, for people who want to see for themselves just how much writing there is that counters, or straight up ignores, the persistent gotta go fast argument of a lot of recent interlocutors. I don't intend to start in the deep end here. The idea is to chart as succinctly as possible, one trajectory that covers the last five years. But that will nonetheless involve going over accelerationism's core observations before exploring what unconditional accelerationism specifically brings to the table. Spoilers, they're not that different from one another, but if you are new to all of this and looking for more of a comprehensive introduction, you're still best starting off with Urbanomics Comprehensive Reader, hash accelerate, Published in 2014, Hash Accelerate starts with summer texts from Marx and others, jumps to texts in orbit of 1968 from Deleuze, Firestone, Lyotard, speeds through Land and the CCIU, and then ends with a load of post CCIU missives from the early Accelerists' core contributors. It also comes with a genius Robin Mackay introduction, whose compression skills are unmatched. Suffice it to say, you get a lot of bang for your buck. What I think is interesting about Hash Accelerate now is that it tees accelerationism up for all the various offshoots it has sped off in since, neo-reaction, neo-rationalism, xenofeminism, to pick just three seemingly unrelated discourses that have grown out of accelerationist discussions and which have largely come into their own in the aftermath of the Urbanomic Reader's publication. Hash Accelerate is, in this sense, a suitably swift shot fired through the jungle, connecting with many disparate but resonant thoughts. However, many more have accumulated since its publication. In light of that, I want to share and discuss some relatively recent online essays that I'd recommend starting with if you want to, in the apparent spirit of things, get up to date fast. But not too fast. As ever with this sort of thing, it's long perhaps defeating the purpose of offering up something digestible, but the extensive commentary here is necessary, I think. My intention with it is to show how each of the different posts, essays and articles selected here paint a very different picture of accelerationism than the one a lot of people think they know. Reading them on their own will do this in itself, I hope, but just to be on the safe side, I'm leaving no point unconnected from the one which precedes it. This level of caution feels necessary because, I must admit, I've been astounded this week by how poor an understanding of accelerationism so many people have, including people who actively identity themselves as some sort of accelerationist. But this, too, is no new trend. Vincent Garten, Excavating the Origins of Accelerationism Pete Wolfendale, So, Accelerationism, What's All That About? What is interesting about the texts that appear here or in Hash Accelerate is that they draw on the entire history of philosophy. Part of what is difficult about accelerationism, no doubt leading to misunderstandings, is that it doesn't like being pinned down. This isn't a purpose of elusiveness but rather it describes a tendency that has always been with us. Vince Carton explains this best when he writes. To trace the genealogy of accelerationism is thus fraught with problems. On the most superficial level, accelerationism has existed for about a decade. At its unspoken core, it is impossibly ancient. Different focuses will yield wildly divergent results. No doubt an article on accelerationism in some distant future edition of the Jess Chicklish Grundbegriff would take care to highlight the term's formulation by, Benjamin, Noyes, having traced the concern with acceleration through obvious references back to Deleuze and Guattari and from there to Nietzsche. It would look to the term's adoption and disavowal by different groups on left and right in the mid to late 2010s. As an exercise in etymology this would be interesting enough, as a genealogical investigation it would be disastrous. Accelerationism is not a specific reading of Nietzsche any more than capitalism is a reading of Smith. A Marxian accelerationist does not need to have read a single page of A Thousand Plateaus to remain an accelerationist. Similar conclusions, 
similar sentiments, have been expressed from traditions seemingly almost entirely unaware of each other. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that it is best not to think of accelerationism, in the first instance, as a set of ideas at all. Nick Land has described what he terms libidinal materialism as more a jangling of the nerves than a set of doctrines. Accelerationism is not identical with libidinal materialism, but the same observation seems abundantly to apply to it. With the appropriate historical sensibility, modulations of accelerationism soon well up in widely divergent contexts, all over the world, advancing along the storm front of industrial capitalism. It emerges as a sensation of the acceleration characteristic of modernity itself, expressed in different ways by Marx, Hierato, Baudrillard, and plenty others. The drive to posit this expression in specifically philosophical form is perhaps peculiarly influenced by Western tradition. The sensation itself is not. Accelerationism is, in this sense, nothing more than a view of modernity, the very feeling of modernity, even. This is, of course, a vast oversimplification too but it is a better one than gotta go fast. It's very difficult to find out where exactly this gotta go fast argument came from. Did it come from Benjamin Noyes? He was the one who coined the term accelerationism as an insult, a joke, and it was apparently Mark Fisher who reclaimed it and turned it around. I think the jury is still out on whether this was a good idea or not. Accelerationism is a wonderfully vague carrier to give a borough academic home to this jangling of the nerves but noise petulance, which I've never understood, coming from a supposed but ill lane, has nevertheless remained attached to it. This wholly inaccurate simplification is, because of this, as old as accelerationism itself, but, we might do well to note, so are corrections to the contrary. For instance, Whilst writing this primer I found an old blog post by Pete Wolfendale which contained paragraphs as exasperated as my own from the other day, and Pete's post was written four years ago. He starts by quoting from a review of the Urbanomic Reader written by Malcolm Harris for the new inquiry called Turn Down for What? Giving it an immediate how do you do, fellow kids vibe. Harris writes, apparently attempting to summarize the book's view of the universe. Capitalism reduces the cost of being alive to a minimum, but just to shrink the worker's slice as the pie grows. Eventually through this process it becomes evident that the owners are parasites, and the expropriated expropriate the expropriators. If all this is the case, then it logically follows that we shouldn't be trying to slow the expropriation down, but rather we should attempt to speed the system toward its inevitable doom. This dynamic is the premise for the collection hash accelerate, new from the radically odd publisher Urbanomic. A palpably frustrated Pete adds. As Alex Williams has noted before, this is not a position that anyone has ever held. Okay, let's qualify that a bit. It might be the case that some people have held this position, and that some of them now even think of themselves as accelerationists. So let's limit it to the claim that it is not a position that anyone in the hash accelerate reader has ever held. Not even Nick Land? No. Not even Nick Land. He likes capitalism. He wants to accelerate it, but not because it will collapse under the weight of its own contradictions. What about Deleuze and Guattari? No. According to them nothing has ever died of contradictions, and so whatever deterritorializing force they aim to accelerate, and whatever end they aim to accelerate it towards, neither is a contradiction or its inevitable collapse. What about Srinasek and Williams? No. Much of what they do can be seen as breaking with D and G, and a fortiori with land, and returning to a much more Marxist position, but they explicitly refuse to see the transition between capitalism and post-capitalism as a dialectical sublation brought about by the intensification of contradictions. Well. What about Marx then? Just how much Marx is invested in a substantive notion of contradiction as the metaphysical driving force of history is a question up for debate, and I'm not about to stumble into that particular hermeneutic hornet's nest. Nevertheless, it's clear that even if we take the strongest historical determinist, for example, dialectical materialist, reading of Marx we can find, 
he would still reject the inference from the claim that the increasing self-evidence of capitalist parasitism will bring about the expropriation of expropriation all on its own to the claim that we should therefore attempt to speed the system towards its inevitable doom. None of these canonical figures, and nobody else within the collection, wants inevitable doom, although, admittedly, Nickland's vision might look like this to everyone but him. Indeed, the emerging left accelerationist strand is motivated by a recognition that capitalism will not auto-destruct once the mask slips, on the one hand, see the incredible retrenchment of neoliberalism after the 2008 financial crisis, and recognition that we need to plan and act to avoid inevitable doom, on the other, for example, environmental crisis, economic crisis, cultural crisis, etc. So, just to repeat, accelerationism is not about accelerating the contradictions of capitalism in any sense. Whatever is being accelerated, and there are severe and significant disagreements about this, it is not contradictions, and whatever transition this acceleration aims towards, it is not societal collapse. Got that? Can we move on? Good. So, with that being said, where should we start? Wikipedia, Accelerationism. I know, fucking lol, but, as Nick Land rightly notes in an article we'll talk about in a minute, the Accelerationism Wikipedia page is short, but of exceptionally high quality. Whether this is still true, I'm not sure. Update 05 2020, this is definitely no longer true, Wikipedia's own disclaimer is also worth taking heed of. They acknowledge the article may be too technical for most readers to understand. I think this is less to do with the technical nature of the article and more to do with its intensive stratification, its implicit layering of various positions on top of one another into something less cohesive than it seems to think it is. Whether it helps with our understanding or not, the accelerationism Wikipedia page is worth picking apart if only to reveal just how flattened this awkward genealogy has nonetheless become. For example, it is worth noting that the article's introductory paragraph contains three separate views of accelerationism and, in an inspired bit of wiki editing, the gotta go fast school of accelerationist critique is mentioned last. The key sentence, for me, is the middle one. Some contemporary accelerationist philosophy starts with the Deleuze Guattarian theory of deterritorialization, aiming to identify, deepen, and radicalize the forces of deterritorialization with a view to overcoming the countervailing tendencies that suppress the possibility of far-reaching social transformation. We'll discuss what exactly deterritorialization is in a moment but it is here that we see the impetus behind the fevered splitting which has defined accelerationism as it has appeared in the last few years. Amusingly, this sentence does come with a superscript caveat, clarification needed. The difficulty of providing this clarification pulls in two directions, however. First of all, it is telling that the suggestion here is that this is a starting point for some, this has always been the foundation, as far as I am aware, but much work has since chosen to ignore it in favor of other, more superficial, readings, but what is more challenging is summarizing what all these social transformations may consist of or pragmatically entail. The answers to this remain largely up for debate. So, what we are left with is a tendency for complication and a tendency for simplification each pulling in the opposite direction. Hence why we have an alphabet of accelerationisms, ELOC, ARUC, GEOC, BELOC, ZEDOC, etc., all of which are either eminent explorations of this central point about deterritorialization or they focus instead on naming the social transformations that are relevant to a specific demographic within this process, for instance, how those demographics and the burgeoning subjects they contain are central to, exemplary of or most affected by the process is described by accelerationism in itself. More on that later too. Unconditional accelerationism is intended to be the overarching theory here. Many of these variants are interesting and important but we have to acknowledge the fact that they place conditions on accelerationism, and so you, ACK attempts to consider the process that grounds them all, without condition. Mark Fisher, Post-Capitalist Desire Nick Land, A Quick and Dirty Guide to Accelerationism So, 
Why is unconditional accelerationism necessary? Why did it emerge when it did and for what purpose? What are its observations? We'll touch on all of these questions, I hope, as we proceed but in order to talk about this I think it's first worth pointing to these two essays by Mark Fisher and Nick Land, linked above. Neither of these texts are foundational. In fact, they're relatively recent. They are, instead, two introductions written by two key crewers who consider where accelerationism has come from and, most importantly, where they think it might, or should, go in the future. Read together today, they are two very prescient texts written by two writers with their fingers firmly on the pulse. Fisher's essay is characteristically great and it is a text that I have always thought of as a lost acid communism text, it is, at the very least, an account of the negative inspiration for that now unfinished book. I quoted from post-capitalist desire in the previous post as it contains what I think is the best and most concise overall summary of the accelerationist project, echoing the previously quoted and more condensed Wikipedia fragment. He writes. Capitalism is a necessarily failed escape from feudalism, which, instead of destroying encastment, reconstitutes social stratification in the class structure. It is only given this model that Deleuze and Watar is called to accelerate the process makes sense. It does not mean accelerating any or everything in capitalism willy-nilly, in the hope that capitalism will thereby collapse. Rather, it means accelerating the processes of destratification that capitalism cannot but obstruct. This is notable because, whilst Fisher is generally seen as the sort of, grandfather, or foster dad, maybe, I don't know, whatever, of left accelerationism, L. Slashuk, having mentored Slasek and Williams, and being PhD supervisor to the latter if I recall correctly. This essay considers Land's persistent legacy and perhaps inadvertent influence over an anti-capitalist, or, rather, for Fisher, a post-capitalist, accelerationism that has emerged in the last decade or so. Whilst it disagrees with Land's apparently anti-Marxist texts, it nevertheless champions them for the way they demonstrate the challenges that the left has to face if it is going to survive the near future. We can summarize these challenges as follows. The left must counter the assumption that capitalism is the monopoly on desire. The left must address the contradictions between its calls for revolution and its political and formal aesthetic conservatism. The left must recognize the terrain on which politics now operates as being largely technological, with said technologies being more and more embedded within everyday life. These challenges point to what are outdated, misguided and left melancholic visions of a world which must be overcome. Fisher argues, persistently, that some aspects of capitalism, indeed, some of its major mechanisms, can work in the left's favor if it figures out how best to channel them, note not seizing them but rather diminishing their monopoly on certain effects. Credit where due. The left has made considerable headway towards deconstructing these principles in more recent years, particularly in the aftermath of his death, most tragically, with Fisher's first and third points being addressed more and more publicly, particularly in the UK in 2017. Number 3, however, seems to have become a central L, a tenet at the expense of the other two points raised. For more on this point, see, Mark's essay, talk touch screen capture. Number two, specifically, remains maligned. It is, in minced words, a call for a new appreciation of outsideness. It is pointing to the same advice accelerationist adjacent discourses have been advocating for decades. Head for the outside of your present mindset, over-influenced as it is by that which you say you oppose, and do it by latching onto the internal death drive of the system itself. Land's essay, too, is perhaps uncharacteristically clear and lucid, contrasting his better-known hallucinogenic mode found in circuitries and machinic desire, his essential accelerationist texts, both found in Fanged Numena and the former also being available in Hash Accelerate. Here, in his quick and dirty intro, Land articulates the same advice, in favor of deterritorialization, as invoked by Fisher and as found in the collaborative work of Deleuze and Guattari. He writes, 
for accelerationism a crucial lesson was this, a negative feedback circuit, such as a steam engine governor or a thermostat, functions to keep some state of a system in the same place. Its product, in the language formulated by French philosophical cyberneticists Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, is territorialization. Negative feedback stabilizes a process, by correcting drift, and thus inhibiting departure beyond a limited range. Dynamics are placed in the service of fixity, a higher level stasis, or state. All equilibrium models of complex systems and processes are like this. To capture the contrary trend, characterized by self-reinforcing errancy, flight, or escape, D and G coin the inelegant but influential term deterritorialization. Deterritorialization is the only thing accelerationism has ever really talked about. Before we proceed, first, we should clarify our terms. Territorialization can be understood, literally, for now, as the process of constituting a territory. Territory, here, should be thought of as a process in itself rather than a fixed land mass. It is the process by which a state or ruler establishes and maintains their domain of rule and influence. To quote Stuart Eldon, whose new book I've been reading for a future patchwork post. Territory is not a product, but a process, formed by a range of practices and techniques, including bordering, dividing, conquering, excluding, enclosing, controlling, surveying, and mapping. In order to understand territory, we need to move beyond the simplistic definition, and to examine multiple registers, political and geographical issues certainly, but also economic, strategic, legal, and technical concerns. This is a means of grasping the complexities of how territory has been understood and practiced in different ways in diverse times and places. Territorialization, then, in explicitly deluso guatarian terms, is this same process abstracted and laid over subjectivity. Capitalism itself resonates with such a view of this process and it should be understood as operating across both scales. It is far more than an economic system and this is increasingly more apparent. Indeed, we can argue that, today, it is the internal engine of the territorial process in itself with capitalist territorialization shaping minds as thoroughly as it molds nation-states. So, just as Fisher infers in the above quote, capitalism's development is key to understanding accelerationism. A quick, and no doubt flawed, summary. Just as under a feudal system, where a subject must work for the benefit of a landowner in order to enjoy certain rights and protections, the modern worker is locked in a similar mentality of servitude in return for the basic means to exist. Whilst the dissolution of feudalism consolidated power away from feudal lords and over to the head of a nation-state, its labor dynamics nonetheless remain as the primary source of productive power at various scales, its Marx's concept of primitive accumulation and the source of Fisher's assessment of a failed escape. Aware of the fragility of its own position, however, the system implements countless fail-safes, whereby the territory appears fluid and adaptive to its constant internal changes. Concessions may be made whilst other elements are heavily enforced. The wavering boundaries of the territory, dangled in front of us like a carrot, simply offer up the illusion of the new without providing it, producing what Fisher once called a state of frenzied stasis. Indeed, the illusion of contingency within the system is allowed to proliferate just enough so that the overarching structure is stabilized. This is also what Land already describes above. So, whilst capitalism allows for some instances of deterritorialization, that is, instances of territorial dismantling, it uses these instances as moments to refresh, reconsolidate, and strengthen itself, by still inhibiting departure beyond a limited range. In this way, perhaps capitalism can be thought of as a muscle, it rips and tears and flexes but only so that the arm itself becomes stronger, and capitalism is certainly the strong arm of the state. This process was what D plus G referred to as re-territorialization. re, -territorialization. re -territorialization, then, is the daily work out of the body politic. It likes to challenge itself. But only so much. However, there are arguments to be made that say, Given its age, 
the system is not recovering from these workouts as well as it used to, explaining our current set of circumstances. But even if this were true, this process of re-territorialization is particularly evident today. Simply think back to 10 years ago in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, or even two years ago in the atmosphere surrounding the election of Trump or the Brexit referendum. There was palpable Luendis and I fear and times they are a change in excitement about where the world was heading. So many events felt unprecedented and it seemed like major change was not on the horizon but right in front of us. Now what do we have? Retrenched neoliberalism. More of the same. Trump and Brexit, in particular, have only served to exacerbate the system's internal workings, like a snake biting off way more than it can chew, bulging grotesquely, illuminating its stretched limits, but digesting it all the same and remaining structurally intact. Deterritorialization, then, can be understood as the process of dismantling attacking and exiting the overarching influence and rule of imposed social structures. We will come back to this notion of deterritorialization again, but for now it is worth emphasizing that what people hope to achieve here, by siding with this process, is the radically new, unoutsideness, a move beyond this cloistered realm of present stasis. Not just something a bit different, but a wholesale shift in how we think about the structure of our reality people nonetheless have very particular opinions on what the world can or should look like after this point, but the arguments are largely speculative, precisely because we must first recognize the extent to which our visions of the future are informed by the system we are encased with. This, again, echoes Fisher's capitalist realism argument, but also his burgeoning acid communist thought which hoped to invoke psychedelia as a vision of communism which was wholly disjointed from capitalist expectations and propaganda. Whilst outsideness is worth focusing on here as something, that should be, central to all accelerationist projects, we must also contend with the fact that it is something that has become almost wholly associated with land in the minds of many casual interlocutors no doubt due to his at outsideness twitter handle and xenosystems blog title outside in however as he rightly points out above accelerationism has never concerned itself with anything else Sruss and williams even end their left accelerationism manifesto for an accelerationist politics with the proclamation that the future must be cracked open once again unfastening our horizons towards the universal possibilities of the outside to concede ownership of the certain names of these processes and concepts is misguided, I personally think, and it is often to counter the attacks of resentocrats and vampires. An anecdotal case in point, I know someone who got called a fascist once just for wearing one of these, the left jumps semantic ships because of this constantly, sometimes to its detriment but sometimes to shield against reductive readings. I've written about this before, why Fisher writes on egress instead of exit, for instance. But the detrimental results are the ones which reverberate most disappointingly, having a very real impact on thought and praxis. For instance, as Land rightly goes on to note in his essay, L. Uck has largely lost this outside orientation because left accelerationism appears to have deconstructed itself back into traditional socialist politics. And this has been done primarily, through not wanting to share a vocabulary with undesirables. Land, however, does conveniently fail to mention R, ak here, but that is an interesting story in itself. There is a common, if misleading, argument used by unconditional accelerationism, in this regard, which is that unconditional accelerationism is right accelerationism as Land initially intended it. That is not to side with right accelerationism as many know of it online, however. If left accelerationism clipped its own wings by dropping the philosophy and moving into the cloistered world of government lobbying, as I've heard Sunasek and or Williams have quite literally done, then R. Uck and its Twitter interlocutors have moved in a similarly impotent direction. This is a tendency already foreseen by Land on his NRX blog, Xenosystems, and this blog could be considered in some ways, to be an explicit and compensatory response to left accelerationism's burgeoning techno-socialism. Right accelerationism, however, unlike its left-wing counterpart, 
has always sought to maintain a loose separation between its accelerationist philosophy and its neo-reactionary political wing. Right accelerationism has always been a bad name, in this regard, but see, ac, for capitalist accelerationism, isn't that flattering an abbreviation? This is because right accelerationism writings typically describe a process whilst NRX offers up a political trajectory which will accelerate towards the gaps, the outsides to our present that the analysis of this process in itself reveals and may allow for. This is achieved, controversially, by rejecting many of the political foundations that contemporary politics holds dear but such is the nature of outsideness, it means being outside more things than many you're comfortable with, it is precisely a move beyond your theoretical and political comfort zone. But things are not so simple as this. All that is important to note here is this explicit separation between philosophical observation and political action. This is not to eject either but to understand them as being complementary but nonetheless distinct modes of thought. This is unconditional accelerationism's maneuver also. What is worth emphasizing here though, is the further delineation Land offers on his NRX blog, of a type which is totally alien to any left-wing discourses, NRX's inner and outer variants. Nick Land, Outsideness There are a number of early Xenosystems posts that I think are essential reading for anyone interested in you, but Outsideness is my personal favorite as it is astoundingly prescient in articulating the errors that have undermined recent neoliberal triumphs, Brexit and Trump. Here, land rights of an inner and an outer NRX. For the inner faction, a firmly consolidated core identity is the central ambition, inner NRX, as a microculture, models itself on a protected state, in which belonging is sacred, and boundaries rigorously policed. Outer NRX, defined primarily by exit, relates itself to what it escapes. It is refuge and periphery more than a substitute core. It does not ever expect to rule anything at all, above the most microscopic level of social reality, and then under quite different names. The patchwork is for it a set of options, and opportunities for leverage, rather than a menu of potential homes. It is intrinsically nomad, unsettled, and micro-agitational. Its culture consists of departures it does not regret. While not remotely globalist, it is unmistakably cosmopolitan, with the understanding that the cosmos consists of chances to split. The outside is the place of strategic advantage. To be cast out there is no cause for lamentation, in the slightest. Here, exit is understood as being achieved via a detour to the right rather than wholly based on right-wing principles. And yet, on Twitter, you'd be forgiven for wondering if any outer NRX people exist anymore, or have ever. The tragic irony of this setup and its shitpost phase shift to Twitter is that the acolytes land has attracted over the years have generally doubled down on what is an inherently inner NRX orientation, oblivious to the larger project. Land, in many ways, remains the only consistent R, a counter NRX voice in the blogus. Note blogus rather than on Twitter where boomer shitposting undermines more formal explorations of his own ideas. In light of this, Benjamin Noy's pithy critique of Land's position as a Deleuze in Thatcherism comes to mind, which is funny if not that accurate, it's as useful as pointing out Ballard had Thatcherite tendencies, it sort of misses the point, which we discussed on the blog once already, but, indeed, it resonates more the older Land gets and the more he seems to act his age on social media. Nevertheless, the online knew, a contingent, when it began, was largely outer NRX sympathetic, and largely remains so, causing persistent consternation amongst readers but, in truth, it remains sympathetic to any outer-oriented politics. It's just unfortunate that left accelerationism discourse was too stunted in the post-2010 moment to develop a sense of its own internal dynamics that was as nuanced as this. This blog, in particular, thinks of itself as outer left in being fundamentally anti-statist and, despite anti-statism being common to many left-wing discourses, it has always been telling that talk of a communism which emphasizes this point upsets people and leads to socialists calling you a crypto-fascist, and, 
predictably, calling them in a left probably won't calm many nerves but that's where I personally stand. It is perhaps because of this that the very concept of outsideness has fallen into diluted disrepute on the left more broadly, exacerbated, in the UK at least, by the utter failure to conjure an interesting conversation out of the Brexit debate. Jim, Clev Monkey vs. The Accelerationists, 1. This friction between an inner and outer accelerationism from the left is encapsulated best, I think, by Jim's final posts on his Pogo Principle blog, right before he scrapped it and moved out to the real movement. These posts are interesting because, whilst accelerationism is their primary focus, it is introduced as a wholly new topic for Jim. He'd been called an accelerationist and so decided to check out the literature and instead finds himself reading, listening to Benjamin Noyes and finding very little to admire. The above point about antistatism is key to this post as what Jit takes issue with most fundamentally is Noyes' equivalence between neoliberal small government politics and a more decidedly Marxist abolitionism, what Noyes called state phobia. Je writes. In place of a purely moral critique of capitalism, Noyes wants to provide us with a purely ideological critique of the capitalist state. The state is capitalist not because it is the ideal representative of the interest of capital but because it has been captured by ideologues. This is the real reason Noyes is so dismissive of accelerationism, not because it can be dismissed, but because he must dismiss it. Landian accelerationism posits a state that is absolutely indifferent to both classes, because it operates directly as the capitalist. For this state, the proletarians are merely a source of surplus value, while the bourgeois class are entirely superfluous altogether. In a relevant passage, Noyes states, in a provocative series of formulations Foucault argues that this state phobia permeates modern thought. This state phobia, says Noyes can be found in the writings of Debord and Marcuse as well as in Sombart. This state phobia, he warns, leaves us vulnerable to neoliberalist ideology and these writers are simply bending to a long-standing anti-statist wind. Of course, this anti-statist wind appears, first, not in post-war Germany, but in the German ideology as the communist consciousness of the proletariat the consciousness of a class of individuals who, in order to assert themselves as individuals, must overthrow the state. This, of course, is a formulation Noyes would not recognize even if someone dropped the fucking book on his head. You really have to mark what fucking Noyes is doing here, the communist consciousness of the working class, which is the consciousness of a need for a fundamental revolution, the abolition of the state and a society founded on voluntary association is here redefined by noise as a mere state-phobic bourgeois ideology. The effort is nothing if it is not the most brazen fucking attempt to redefine an entire historical epoch in favor of a Marxist dead end. Here we see the vision of the capitalist state and a critique of academic Marxist discourses which you, Eck explicitly operates with, viewing the capitalist state as that which is absolutely indifferent to both classes, because it operates directly as the capitalist. This is often dismissed as a preposterous thinking that imagines capital as an autonomous entity, and whilst it does lend itself to some fun sci-fi thinking when simplified to this extent, the suggestion here is rather that the state and capital are a productive machine in themselves. Ed Berger's blog is a veritable treasure trove of writing around these points and his absence from this list is something I regret but this is down to nothing other than not knowing which post to pick. Go read it all. Ja goes on to address this further in his post, and it's a brilliant two-parter so I recommend reading the rest of it, but what I want to focus on here, in explicit relation to our brief discussions of deterritorialization and the rethinking of political subjects is the gap that Ja leaves open here between the states and the proletariat, bourgeoisie. If capitalism is indifferent to the classes stratified for its accumulative production then we seem to be left with a missing subject of accelerationism. Simon O'Sullivan, The Missing Subject of Accelerationism Where I think unconditional accelerationism emerges from, in light of the scrum of various question mark accelerationisms in the early 2010s, is in orbit of this essay from Simon O'Sullivan. This is not to say that it is an explicit influence. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, 
but I do think it asks questions that we now see many unconditional accelerationism interlocutors attempting to address and answer. If being born into a capitalist system inevitably shapes our view of the world but it is a world that is effectively indifferent to us then many accelerationist thinkers have sought to give a name to a newly emergent subject. This is true, I think, across the political spectrum, with a new subject being either radically new or the affirmation of a classic, read, mythical, subject from an earlier point in capitalism's development. The production of new subjectivities are nonetheless generally seen as being the default left acceleration is a position, however, as Simon makes clear. On the face of it what has become known as left accelerationism involves something more immediately recognizable, a communist subject, or a subject that is the product of collective enunciation. Right accelerationism, on the other hand, at least as incarnated in the writings of Nick Land would seem to call for an end to this subject altogether, the figure drawn in the sand as Michel Foucault once had it, in favor of a specifically non-human machinic process that continues alongside, and is more or less oblivious to the human. However, whilst one is seen as productive and the other obliterative, both nonetheless seek an outside to the subjectivity we collectively have right now. And so, Simon notes that this new subjectivity is, whichever way you look at things, absent. See capitalism is not just an abstract in a human agency out there, instantiated in forms of technology, and so forth, that is, as a supramolar entity. It is also in here, producing our very subjectivity on what we might call a molecular level. Capitalism goes all the way down, determining our affective states as well as our very desires and the contours of our innermost worlds. Subjectivity, then, is not solely a rational business in this sense or, at least, those aspects not involved in the project of reason are also crucial to our sense of who and what we are, or, indeed, what we might become. Any subjectivity beyond capitalism, even one produced from within the latter, will have to deal with this and get involved in the whole complex mess of being alive, not least addressing the various affective tonalities that capitalism engenders, from an omnipresent, ambient anxiety, to resentment and depression, to all-out paralyzing fear. It will not be enough to take on, or commit to, a new set of ideas, or put our faith solely in technological progress, subjectivity has to be produced differently at this level. It is in these terms and for this reason that I pointed to the importance of the affective aspects of the Warwick scene above, and especially its more non-philosophical aspects. It offered something different, at least in terms of the moribund academy, and the humanities more generally at that time. This is not to say that giving attention to this area is the most important aspect of any ethico-political project today or indeed that the scene in Warwick could operate as any kind of blueprint, its effective aspects were no doubt themselves complex and contradictory, but it is to say that without an account of, and experimentation with, the effective production of subjectivity, any diagnosis of the problems produced in and by capitalism, or strategy to deal with them, remains too abstract, or, remains abstract in only a partial way. Vincent Garten Unconditional Accelerationism as Antipraxis Xenigothic, Fragment on the Event of Unconditional Acceleration From here we might wade into one of unconditional accelerationism most contentious subjects, antipraxis. Praxis is, of course, the process by which a theory is embodied and realized, put into practice, and so the most common assumption is that antipraxis is against action altogether. Worse still, the argument is that the best accelerationist praxis is to just do nothing. However, I think the point being made here is precisely the point echoed above. The left-wing desire to make everything into a praxis is often misguided and devoid of context. It's not to say that you should do nothing but rather than the observations of accelerationism are not for doing anything with. It's like arguing for a praxis of the theory of gravity, and what is that meant to look like? jumping up and down? All you're likely to achieve is burnout, accelerating your own demise rather than that of an overarching system itself. This is not, however, to suggest that capitalism is as fixed as gravity but it would certainly like us to think so.
The problem being addressed here is one of the key problems tackled by post-Kantianism, from Fichte and Schelling to Nietzsche and beyond to Bataille and Deleuze. In this sense, we might say that unconditional accelerationism is the equivalent of a natter philosophy for late capitalist modernity. It is the apprehension of late capitalism in its totality, which includes human subjectivity as a product of it rather than as some entity which exists as witness to it and can intervene in its mechanisms. This is the point argued by Vince when he writes that the problem has been muddied by its own continual posing in humanist terms, which have provoked a refusal to understand the enormity of the issues at stake. From this perspective of humanism, thought is assimilated entirely to the objective of negotiating the problems that are held to confront humanity. Philosophically, it is concerned with epistemological understanding founded implicitly or not on the centrality of a coherent human subject, critically, it reduces the world to the relations of power practiced by humans towards humans, politically, it immerses itself in defining and putting into motion a better human society. Thought is rendered finally as a series of technical questions that constitute the tactical mapping of a topography whose ultimate form is placed beyond dispute. This insistent backwater parochialism has eclipsed the intellectually interesting content of accelerationism. In colloquial usage on the left, for instance, accelerationism has come to denote merely the idea that the situation of humanity must get worse before it gets better. At the heart of this definition lies the insistent, obsessional humanist question, what is to be done? The fundamental question of praxis. The answer is rendered, we must make things worse, so that they get better. This uninteresting idea has provoked an avalanche of furious critique of a commensurate intellectual scale. It is the doctrine, we are told, of a dim child, trapped in a train about to crash, pretending he's the driver. Quite right. Yet the critics protest too much, this is a feeling that has been characteristic of modern radicalism for centuries. Fourier's prophecies of impending catastrophe shade into the Leninist theory of the intensification of contradictions, on and on up to the present day. A hundred years ago this idea was called catastrophism, and if it is a sickness, it is a sickness that is far more powerful and pervasive than most casual dismissals of the idea would have us believe. And so, the argument becomes that any marginal praxis which attempts to usurp overarching structure is inherently naive. But again, the suggestion is not to do nothing. This is simply a failure of the imagination to consider an outside to that which is, for the subject, all encompassing. The unconditional accelerationist, instead, referring to the colossal horrors presented to the human agent all the way from the processes of capital accumulation and social complexification to the underlying structure, or seeming absence of structure, of reality itself, points to the basic unimportance of unidirectional human agency. We hurl defiance to the stars, but in their silence, when we see them at all, the stars return only crushing contempt. To the question what is to be done? Then, she can legitimately answer only, do what thou wilt, and let go. Do what thou wilt, since with human agency displaced, the world will root around our decisions, impressing itself precisely through our glittering fractionation. Taking the smallest steps beyond good and evil, the unconditional accelerationist, more than anyone else, is free at heart to pursue what she thinks is good and right and interesting, but with the ironical realization that the primary ends that are served are not her own. For the unconditional accelerationist, the fastidious seriousness of the problem solvers who propose to save humanity is absurd in the face of the problems they confront. It can provoke only Olympian laughter. And so, in its colder variants, which are those that win out, accelerationism, tends to laugh. This freedom is what antipraxis means, and this uncompromising conceptual opposition not to the practice, but to the very capacity to regulate the transcendental diagram of acceleration, and the overthrow of normative commandments this provokes, constitutes one form of its unconditionality. And with this, we can hear the murky waters already rushing down the streets. There is a much longer essay to be written here, 
which I intend to start working on soon once the appropriate reading materials arrive in the post, which is to further explore the resonance between accelerationist philosophy and the insights of Natter philosophy which suggest that a fatalism can lead to freedom. And this is an argument I picked up previously in a very brief essay considering the Deleuze's logic of sense. The core line from this book, for me, being its call to become me, the quasi-cause of what is produced within us. N1X, Gender Accelerationism, a black paper. Whilst the anti-praxist debate continues far beyond this, with Ed Berger writing a post which explores this in further detail, for me it is Nix's Gender Accelerationism black paper which demonstrates one reality of Vince's letting go. Here, she explores the inherent outsideness of being a woman, of being gay and, most poignantly, being trans, considerations mapped expertly onto the history of computer programming. She writes. The essay Turing wrote famously introduced the Turing test for AI, computing machinery and intelligence, 1950, set, the standard for a perfect AI being one that can trick a human into believing it is itself or human. As Land points out in his post, it's important and interesting to consider that Turing didn't write the test as an insider, as a passing human, but rather as an outsider, as a gay man. For queer people, passing is a reality, much like it is a reality for AI. Passing as human isn't a broad and inclusive category, anything but. For women there is already the notion of alienness or otherness that makes them out to be less than human in the eyes of patriarchal humanism, and likewise for queer people because they reject the futurity of humanism, the literal reproduction of the same. But for no one else, especially in the latter half of the 2010s, is passing a more pronounced facet of daily life than for the trans woman. So much so that passing is literally the word for what many trans women aspire towards, to pass as a cis person. There are many reasons to have this desire, but the biggest one, the one that AI and trans women both share to a very literal degree is this, if an emerging AI lies to you, even just a little, it has to be terminated instantly. Here we see the impact of capitalist modernity's limiting of its own outwards drift on burgeoning subjectivities. Where before we read Simon's hash accelerate review, calling for the effective production of subjectivity, in Nikes's essay we have an account of a decisively modern scientific field of interest which has consistently done just that, even when the dominant subjectivities that populate that industry are patriarchal and state capitalist. And so, Nikes calls for a sort of gender abolitionism against that primary structure which territorializes the gendered human subject, once again inhibiting departure beyond a limited range. Nikes continues. It is the logic of gender to subsume the outside into a binarist framework that delegitimizes the outside. The feminine is treated as a lack because it resists the phallogocentric tendency towards the order and preservation of humanist equilibrium. It isn't conducive towards the projects of patriarchy, so it is worthless to it, is given the status of a second-class citizen in the gender binary. It is a double articulation where the productive potential of the feminine is captured in the service of patriarchy, and so, to accelerate gender is, to, emancipate the object from its subject, and production from subjects and objects. The outside which has become identified with the feminine by the very structures of identification it fights against makes its exit from humanism and patriarchy in this feminine form. The feminine becomes untethered from the reproductive logic of humanism, the female is no longer in the service of the male as a machine to produce the future, to produce offspring to inherit the spoils of production, but rather the future produces itself faster than human beings are capable of. Many people have taken issue with Nikes's essay but it is surely one of the most important contributions to the unconditional acceleration sphere for the way it demonstrates just how difficult the journey to an outsideness can be. This is how far down the territorialization goes and if gender accelerationism is unpalatable to you, you're not going to have much luck with weathering anything scaled up from this. This can likewise be seen as a challenge to a comment made previously by Michael James when arguing that unconditional accelerationists don't seem to be living unconditional accelerationism lifestyles, whatever they are. However, 
Taking the size of the unconditional accelerationism transcontingent into consideration suggests he doesn't really know what he's looking for in that respect anyway. But this is not to place trans rights as the ultimate foundation for unconditional accelerationism discourse. It is gender accelerationism for a reason, recognizing its own particular relevance to accelerationist discourses and how this subjective and malleable subset of humanity as a whole is particularly relevant when envisioning a people to come. You, ak, in many ways, goes deeper still into the human subject, exploring time as its absolute foundation. Amy Ireland, The Poem Amanon The accusations that accelerationism just wants to accelerate capitalism no matter the outcome always miss the point which comes prior to this, acceleration suggests an increase in speed but this is non-specific because the exact speed is, in itself, irrelevant, at least in its appearance to us as humans. The question no one ever considers is, how do we measure speed? And the answer is, of course, in time. As Amy Ireland writes in a footnote to her essay The Poem Omenon, speed is important to cyberpositive dynamics, but only insofar as it effectuates a qualitative change, or better, is understood as an intensive quantity. She does not mince words when she writes, the medium of accelerationism is time. If we are to return to Vince Carton's point that accelerationism is better thought of as a philosophy of the sensation of modernity as a jangling of the nerves, Amy is undoubtedly the most skilled chronotechnician when it comes to untangling its implications in this regard. Again in the poem Omenon, she writes. According to its own propaganda, modernity is progressive, innovative, irreversible, and expansive. It plots a direct line out of the cyclical seasonal pulse of pre-modern ecology to a future state of technical mastery and social enlightenment. The modernist imperative to make it new ostensibly refuses the closure and insulation against shock expressed by cyclicality, yet, as Land is quick to point out, subsequently smuggles it back in by other means, championing self-referentiality in modernist aesthetics relying on the cycle as the basic unit for historical and economic analysis, retaining archaic calendaric arrangements, and betraying its prevalence in the popular imagination via the emergence of the time loop as a key archetypal trope in 20th century science fiction. A link between the cyclic inclination and anthropomorphic bias can easily be excavated by pointing to the myriad cyclic rhythms intrinsic to the natural human physiology that surreptitiously conditions modernity's self-apprehension from the inside. This disavowed duplicity at the heart of the modernist enterprise exposes the falseness of its relation to the new by revealing the extent to which it always hedges its bets against radical openness, or what Land will call the outside. Modernity's novelty only arrives via a restricted economy of possibility for which the terms, commensurate with human affordability, are always set in advance. Here we see how time is fundamental to perception even now but no one is suggesting we travel in time, rather what is required, in becoming the quasi-cause of what is produced within us is, perhaps, a new temporality, with temporality here being understood along similar lines as subjectivity. It is a part of perception and, as such, more malleable than we know. Whilst its inner workings are immensely complex and minute, like the inside of a watch in itself, the surface argument is familiar. It is the famous argument from Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Time, as we know it, was invented, primarily as a mode of discipline towards a burgeoning capitalism. But, as I've written about elsewhere, and even, more recently, to some extent, experienced firsthand, there have often been attempts to impose new disciplines and structures, new temporalities, which allow for an escape from that which we cannot otherwise imagine ourselves outside of. Vincent Garton, Acceleration Without Conditions It is here, perhaps, that we can finally begin to approach Vince Garton's original articulation of unconditional accelerationism with the consideration it deserves. Vince writes, Unconditional accelerationism begins with a renunciation of the retrograde politicization to which accelerationism has fallen subject. It denounces the tedious political forms and utopian humanist fantasies of the self-titled left accelerationists, their high modernist pretense to control over the uncontrollable, 
that Slasek and Williams identify Land's work as pointing merely to an indefinite steady state of neoliberalism betrays the radical imitations of their conceptual universe. The triumphal march of capital does not begin and end with a historically limited human ideology. Unconditional accelerationism rejects simultaneously the right accelerationist Syadkowskian concern with control and evaluation, with shaping the explosion of modernity, with guaranteeing its heterogeneity, with exploring the possibilities of a supposedly ever-improving transhumanism. The aggregate improvement of humanity's condition is, to be sure, a fact to which the traditional left seems incapable of responding. But beyond the nostrums of race and nation, the right accelerationists seem all too anxious over the tearing apart of humanity that this process has increasingly entailed. Despite their claim to a radical and dark identity with acceleration, they model with bureaucratic pedantry forms of government within which they hope the explosion can be molded and recuperated. Against all this the unconditional accelerationist celebrates and intensifies the fire of modernity as a whole, both the flows of capital that compress the world ever tighter in a liquid despotism of the machine that is remodeling and resequencing humanity, and the flows of social cybernetics that are overwhelming political institutions, turning despite themselves towards terminal delirium. In the West, it is Frankenstein that constitutes the figure determining modernity's course, the tool that overthrows its master. Trade. Social media. Artificial intelligence. In cybernetic modernity the story is repeated over and again. Unconditional accelerationism identifies with this process of overthrow in its kaleidoscopic multiplicity. System disease. Weaponized nihilism. K insurgency. From this, perhaps we can lay out a clearer enunciation of the unconditional accelerationism project, and with this I'll end this post. Counteract the formal aesthetic conservatism of self described radical politics, on the left and the right. Consider, in the totality of late capitalism, the ways in which humanity, as an agent, is a product of an overarching system over which it might have relatively little influence and certainly no control. Exacerbate the tearing apart of the human subject as we know it, that is, a contemporary human subject which is a product of the forces which surround it and which are fatalistically produced within it, and those systems which limit its persistent outwards flights, gender, the nation-state, et al., for the sake of the radical production of the new. Furthermore, exacerbate the pull outside of the temporality of modernity as that absolute ground of the structure of modern experience modern experience perhaps understood as the temporal enclosure which keeps us separated from other forms of life. Finally, I just want to say that, in writing this, I did not consult anyone else in the U, Uxphere. Whilst I think these texts give a good basis for a consideration of the stakes as Cave Twitter sees them, I am happy to be corrected and challenged on this and it is in no way authoritative. Much like with the patchwork debate, which can be seen as the geopolitical wing of you, a thinking, people have their own research interests and opinions and these do not all coalesce into a total theory. With that in mind, I encourage the suggestion of any further reading which I'm happy to add to the end of this post and periodic updates if other suggestions are offered up.